Can you hear me now? I can hear you. How are you doing? Lovely to see you. You too, my friend. Wow. Hey, Erin, can you uh, just uh, talk to us for a little bit so I can make sure your audio is okay? Yes. How's it going? Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. How's everybody doing? Let me Hi. My audio. My video for some reason is not letting me. Let oh, me it's probably me. Hold on. Oh, yeah, okay. mine too. Yeah, don't worry. I, it's my, I got to make you co host, which is Excellent. fine. Thank you. Yep. Erin. How's it going, Shelly? Erin, I have a question for you. Is your, is your title immediate past president? Yes. Still? Okay. Still. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to be sure I had that right. Mm -hmm. Hi. Hi, Holly. I'm checking on hello, you. Hello, Holly. Hi. Hello, hello. Thank um, you. Vita, can you hi. talk? Yes. Hi. I'm here. There you are. Good. <laughs> oh, I'm just yeah. checking your guys' uh, audio. That's all. So, yeah. Holly, Shelly, Aaron's, and Vita's, Vita's is uh, their vo their voice is great. They can okay. get on. Uh, Shelly, try to uh, to show your video if you don't mind. Perfect. Hey, nice. right. they look great. So it, Holly, um, I know you have a bunch of different panelists on here as well. Just the committee, I think. Do you want me to have them uh, give them access to show their video if they want? The, the committee members are not participating as far as I know. Aaron, what is your, am I, they, uh, Aaron, I don't. I don't think so. Maybe just Mara, if she comes in, just because she's the co-chair, but I don't think any of the members might have the need to do that. Perfect. No, I want them to, yeah. Can we just make sure they're they're muted? Um, sh oh, they'll come in and they can be muted and I'll, I'll watch for that. So right, that's fine. Um, I'm making Chelsea a uh, co-host just in case. Yes. Yeah, she she, share the screen, right? Yeah, she's going to share my screen because um, she's do, going to do Slido and I don't know how the Slido is. So she's going to, it's much easier for her to do the That's whole amazing. presentation. That sounds great. Hi, Chelsea. How do you say your last name? Is it Ranjit? R Ranjit, yeah. Bidya Ranjit. Uh, sorry, guys, there's a glare in here. <laughs> You'd think I'd learn this by now. How is everybody? Great. Doing good. I'm ready to go. <laughs> okay, so, so did everyone get the run of show that I sent? Oh, God. yes. Yeah, and I haven't even looked at it, to be honest. I, I mean, it's very simple. Okay. It's just, I'm going to say hello. Uh -huh. Then I'm going to turn it over to Aaron and he's going to introduce you guys. And then at 45, around 45 after the hour, we're going to try to close the presentations and open for Q and A. Um, and by request of Shelly and Bidya, we're going to put those questions in the chat. And if you want, um, I can monitor, or Aaron, what do you, what do you think? I, I'm happy to monitor the questions and, and that sort of thing. Um, we'll, we'll leave that for the end for, we'll give about a half an hour for um, Q and A and then, and then Aaron can wrap it up um, and encourage people to join the community practice. You have a person from Guam joining us, and it, it's 651 on December 18th. Awesome. Wow. wow. <laughs> 651 a.m. See, it's just you put the right people here. <laughs> that's, all it, that's all it takes. Wow. <laughs> awesome. If, you, if there's other people online, I know we can't hear you, but go ahead and put where you are from the chat. And I'd love to know what kind of um, weather it is where you're at. That's a great idea, Jelly. Well, unfortunately, I'm no uh, Vanessa who can actually play music. So sadly, uh, got stuck <laughs> with the, the lesser person. No, not at all. <laughs> oh, Shelly um, Shelley wants to be co-host. Yeah, because I'm going to be sharing my screen. Nope. I was worried that, you know, the snow that we had, a feed of snow, that we may lose power. <laughs> 
and that I may have to go to the office, but luckily I have power. That's good news. It's so hard, I get you. How much did you get? Did you? We got a foot of snow, but um, the um, western part, I think they got about 18 inches. With this, Oof. generally we get more, but this time we got a little uh, fewer here. How about you, Shelly? We have a dusting. I'm up, I'm way north in northern Minnesota. So like the lakes are frozen over and it's been cold. Holly, I should know this. Who's going first of the panel? Me, Shelly. Shelly. So in about three minutes, I'm going to, um, I'm going to uh, stop sharing my screen and then you can share your screen. Okay. Okay. Shelly, do you want to pull up yours? Sure. Do you see my PowerPoint? Sure do. Do you see that I'm at the Louvre? <laughs> You're muted, Holly. Yes, I do see you. Thanks. Thanks, Aaron. OK, you guys have about four minutes. So Jelly, I expect, well, never mind.
All right, well, it's four o'clock on the East Coast. And so um, I think we'll get started. Welcome everyone. I'm Holly Hexter with COE. Um, thank you so much for being here, wherever you're logging on from and whatever climate <laughs> um, you're calling in from. Um, just a few housekeeping um, notes at the beginning. We're going to record this, of course. And so all participants will receive a copy of the, a link to the recording um, after this webinar. Um, another thing, um, yes, do, it will be sent out. I can't promise it'll be immediately, but in the next few weeks, um, you'll be sent a link for the webinar recording. Um, and in terms of the format today, um, we're going to take questions after the pre presenters make their remarks. Um, and I just ask that you put those comments and questions for the panelists in the chat box, um, if you could. Um, so with that, um, this is the second in a series of webinars uh, co-sponsored by the um, International Access Committee of the COE Board and the International Access Community of Practice. And um, so that has been spearheaded by our International Access Committee, co-chaired by Aaron Cortez and Mara Luna. And I believe the rest of the committee members are on as well today. Um, and um, the idea was that we have, we know that we have all of this knowledge in the community um, about pra best practices for exposing students um, to international experiences. And so we wanted to get a couple of folks who've been doing a great job for many, many years to share their best practices with us. Um, and um, if you enjoyed this event, I hope that you will join the community practice and share your own experiences and practices with the rest of our community. And so now to introduce the panelists, I will turn it over to Erin Cortez. 
Good day, everyone. I hope this uh, this day is going pretty well for you. If it's a new day, like in Guam, then, you know, bright new day for you. Uh, for many of us, it's almost the end of the day. Um, and for many, it's also coming to the end of uh, APR submissions. So, you know, hopefully you all have completed your APRs are almost done with that. So we're excited. Uh, we're excited that it, the break is coming um, and that we all need a, a very well-deserved break. Um, so on behalf of my co-chair, Mara Luna, myself, and the Interna and International Access Committee, um, we want to um, welcome you all. And also, like Holly said, uh, we will have two amazing uh, trio professionals uh, that we keep an eye on because, you know, they have done amazing work. Uh, many of those are people that, you know, myself and many of us look um, look up to, uh, work with either directly and directly. So it is with great pleasure that I am going to introduce both of our panelists today. Um, each one of them will have a time to explain a little bit of their programs, how this, how they have gone to create a, a culture of international access within their programs. So here uh, with us, we have Bija Ranjit, Director of the Center for Academic Programs at the University of Connecticut. Thank you for being with us. And also Shelly Siegel, the Director of Student Support Services at North Hennepin Community College. Thank you for being with us. And with that said, I am gonna pass it on to Director Shelly Siegel, thank you. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. Thank you for being here. Again, I'm the Director of TRIO Programs at North Hennepin Community College in Minnesota. And I'm also the Chair of the International Access Committee for the Educational Opportunity Association. Thank you to Vanessa, Angelica, Maureen, all the people at COE. I am really also honored to be co-presenting with Dr. Vijay Ranjit of the University of Connecticut who's gonna speak after I do. I'm looking forward to that. Um, I also wanna give a special thank you to Aaron Cortez Minor, the immediate past president who we just heard from of the Educational Opportunity Association and co-chair of the International Access Committee and all the members of the committee that are here um, on, the, on the presentation today. Thank you for inviting me and Holly Hexter, thank you for inviting me to speak about one of my great passions, which is assess assisting first-generation college students, low-income students, students with disabilities to engage in study abroad and scholarship opportunities. So when Aaron first chatted with me, if I was interested in presenting, of course I was, I just wasn't quite sure how to talk about uh, study abroad this year under COVID terms. And, but as we chatted, I realized that there's always a lot of work to be done to help create a study abroad and scholarship culture in one's TRIO program. And so that's what I'm gonna focus on today. And hopefully you can see my PowerPoint. I'm just gonna start going through it, okay? So a question, why is study abroad important? And I know a lot of things come to mind, but just as a framework to, think, to start thinking about this, that it is valuable in so many ways. And I listed a few things, how it expands world views, it opens doors for future career opportunities. It exposes students to language, having an academic experience in a new environment, leadership development, personal growth, and of course, confidence building. Um, I thought it was interesting uh, to find out that about half of all college graduates find employment within one year, but that number is double for the graduates who have a study abroad experience. And that 90% of study abroad graduates find employment within six months of earning a degree, 70% report having greater job satisfaction, and they make more money. So, so who, typically, who typically studies abroad? Um, well, not our students. No, it isn't our students. In fact, the majority of people who study abroad from the United States is white females who are from higher socioeconomic backgrounds. Um, I also thought it was important to note that about 26% of Americans have ever traveled overseas. I'm not talking about Canada or Mexico. So um, I thought that was interesting, but 
why we want, why it's so important for us to be creating this culture um, of, of getting our TRIO students and students from under-resourced populations overseas and abroad and studying. So we asked TRIO students why they don't consider it. Um, and you would think it would be finances and you would think that there'd be a lot of reasons, but the number one re reason they said was that they just don't feel it's for them. They don't associate themselves with, the, with that sort of experience. Almost similar to why our first generation college students feel uncomfortable at first being in the college environment. It's, it's similar. So with that, um, I thought I would share a little bit about some of the work I've done in my program. Um, now I'm at a community college. And so I, I put up here that we've assisted nearly over 50 students to apply and attend study abroad programs since 2008. And that might not seem like a large number, but at the community college, it's not um, a typical experience because many just are in their freshman, sophomore year. We don't have an office that hosts study abroad programming. Uh, it's harder to transfer credits in. So in, I feel proud that we've had that many students um, apply and win. And then the majority of them have, have also received significant scholarships to, to attend. And so I wanted to share a few resources. These, um, these resources are either, you know, websites that you can go to to learn more about how to find scholarships. Of course, I'm gonna mention the Council for Opportunity in Education's fantastic Keith Sharon Global Leaders Institute. It's a short-term study abroad. For those of you that don't know, it's been going on for quite some time. It's a short-term study abroad program over the summer and students end up paying somewhere around $2,500. And that includes travel to and from the East Coast. And then it often pays for college credits. The last two years have been in the Netherlands. Um, before that, they were spending uh, their time in Salamanca, Spain. And before that, they were in Liverpool, England when it first started. So these other ent entities, like I say, are good resources for just, if you, if you don't know about them, I thought it would be important to throw them up there to help. So um, I also want to give a big shout out to Educational Opportunity Association. And I want to say that um, EOA, which is our regional trio, trio association in college access, has been very focused on helping support students studying abroad. In fact, they have an established international education committee and they do intentional work around this topic. So if other associations are on the call listening, and I'm not sure if all other associations have a similar model, but I wanted to share it with you. Uh, the board includes $10,000 each year in their annual budget to support students who specifically are chosen from the region to attend the Keith Sharon Global Institute. And that award is divided between the number of students who are chosen. So it can be a significant help, 800 to $1,000. They don't have to apply for the funds as long as they've been selected and as long as they're from a program within the region. So I wanted to, to make sure I highlighted that. So going on, here are some of my students in Salamanca, Spain, um, a few years back. And uh, this, I'm gonna just back up for one second. The person in the middle with the striped shirt, that's Thailand. And I asked, we asked him, you know, why did you, why did you apply? And he said, well, I wanted to find out what it was like to win a scholarship, but I heard about it from you guys so, so much. I was actually getting sick of you bothering me to try to help me figure out how to do this. It's like, oh, I'm just gonna apply. And then of course he won. So um, I think it's, I, th I thought that was kind of sweet. So anyway, moving on. Um, we do have quite a strong emphasis in my particular TRIO program. I have two SSS programs and one Upward Bound. I'm not the director of Upward Bound, but I oversee it. And we have, we all are housed in the same 
suite. Uh, there's 10 of us um, combined with our staff. So we have um, quite a large emphasis on creating this culture of scholarship and study abroad. So I wanted to just point out that in 2019, um, we have 350 SSS programs total and our foundation um, awarded 40%. So 40% of the foundation scholarships went to TRIO SSS students. And then that same year, $70,000 of outside scholarships were awarded to the senior cohort. They have 50 students. Um, and so we're seeing the results of the work that we're doing. So what are we doing? Here's some ideas. I know that a lot of you out there are also doing great things. So I have a, an ask in a, just a few seconds, um, but I wanted to, to just make some, some mention here. Um, so of course, when we're recruiting on campus um, or in the classroom, we're going to talk about this. We also have one of our positions in SSS specifically devoted to helping students apply for study abroad and scholarships. So it's embedded in their job description. And then um, we also have it embedded into all our publications, including uh, when we meet individually with students from the beginning, when we're talking about goals, we announce it through email. We have posters up in the office. We have intensive workshops. We offer them three times a semester, sometimes more, depending on what's coming up. And EOA has some scholarships coming to you coming soon. Um, and then we also work individually with students that are working specifically on their applications one-on-one. -on -one. Um, we also have developed important relationships with the faculty in the registration office, because like I said, in the community college setting, it's a little harder to sometimes transfer those credits in. So they've worked with us and we haven't had any problems. That's kind of an important factor just to be able to, you know, get them to understand the importance of these experiences. Um, we also have study abroad mentors. So students who have studied abroad come back and they work with new entering students who are interested in studying abroad by advising them, giving presentations, working together with them if they want to um, apply. Uh, we add it to our website. We have a specific newsletter on study abroad and scholarship. And then we're always, you know, marketing things. So we make sure the marketing department knows what's going on. So at this time, if you want to, as I'm going and finishing my presentation, I have just a few more slides to share, um, but feel free that if you have some ideas that you're doing in your program to share, because I, I like I say, we all have different structures and what, what work for my area might not work for your, um, how your program is structured. So feel free, it's up to you to, to enter some of your thoughts and ideas into the chat. Um, okay, I'm going to talk briefly now. This, this is the last section of my presentation, but it's one of the most important. It has to do with the personal statement. And because this is the personal statement um, is often for scholarships, for study abroad applications, for entrance into colleges, it's the most, it's one of the most important pieces. So we focus a lot on this. Uh, we start students thinking about this early. Our workshops are interactive where we have several staff members coming together and working diligently with students one-on-one. -on -one. And we focus, like I say, on the personal statement so that students can tell their story. And I'm gonna illustrate something next to show what I'm talking about because the story is pivotal. And I really do believe that it's one of the, the reasons why we've had a lot of success. So what I've done is I'm just gonna give you an example. Um, a common prompt for many scholarships studying abroad is talk about the obstacles you've overcome. So I just chose this as an example to illustrate my point. So sometimes, you know, we'll say, okay, students, now come on and just give us a draft of what you're thinking. Like, how would you address this particular prompt? So I'm gonna read this to you. 
And this is this is a, an example. Um, I have permission. This is not a real student, but I'm going to read this to you, which which is the first thing they would probably bring to us. So my name is Joseph Allen. I am interested in this scholarship, and I'm currently a student at North Hennepin Community College. I'm studying business management. I want to own my own business, and one day, uh, at one day, and then this scholarship will help me achieve this goal. I have had to overcome many obstacles. So I think it would be perfect. I would be a perfect candidate for this scholarship. I am a student in the TRIO program. I've received a lot of help. My GPA is 3.2. I enjoy drawing and sports and have volunteered for Feed My Starving Children. So I, how many of you have seen scholarship applications that look like this? So what we will do is we will start to take this idea and sit, start probing, asking more questions, getting them to talk more about their backgrounds. And so um, here's an, uh, an example of one after we've worked with a student to focus on the story. So, and this is, I have permission, it's not Joseph Allen, but I have permission from this person who actually wrote this. And one hot rainy night, a group of terrorists, terroristic militants kicked into the door of my family's home and ordered everyone into a corner. They collared my father and demanded my family's valuables. Without thinking about the consequences, my brother knocked one of the assailants to the ground, freeing my father from strangulation. The following day, my family was forced to migrate to a refugee camp. We gathered our belongings and scrambled on foot through the jungle in the 90 degree heat to escape. From there, we embarked on a journey we had never imagined, which eventually led me to the United States. I would never believe where I am today, a US citizen, a college student, a leader of my community. TRIO has been the pivotal force in realizing these achievements. So not every student has maybe as a dramatic story, but everyone has a story. Everyone's overcome obstacles. So we will do a lot of probing and working and having students tell what it is they feel comfortable. Of course, they need to feel comfortable telling their stories because they do have, they do make themselves vulnerable oftentimes. But I do believe that that this is the kind of thing that really um, impacts readers when they're when they're hearing stories. We all have uh, students who have overcome amazing obstacles. And so I'm just sharing that one of the strategies we use is to try to get those stories out. And maybe some of you are already doing that too. So, um, so with that said, um, I'm just, now I'm putting in a little plug for what's to come in the spring. I've been working uh, closely with South Mountain Community College. I don't know if any of the trio folks are on today from South Mountain, if you are, big shout out. Uh, but they have a storytelling institute where they award academic degrees for, um, it's, it's an academic certificate in storytelling. And they have um, courses that are transferable. Uh, they've been doing this for 30 years and they, they, they are amazing. So I am um, working in tandem with them and we're gonna be working together this spring to offer workshops to teach not only students, if, if people want students to, to learn more about um, how to tell their story, but also teaching the teacher, like teaching you, your um, trio staff how to help other students tell their stories. So that's coming up. And then that's me. I hope you enjoyed this. <laughs> Contact me. I'm available to answer questions. I hope this was helpful. Thank you so much, Shelly. This has been amazing. Thank you so much for your your what you have shared, how you have done, what you have done for the students. Um, and like I said, we'll we'll have time at the end to take some and some questions um, and and address a few more items. But now we have the pleasure of having Dr. Rajet uh, coming with us. So, Dr. Rajet, if you're ready, I'll yeah. leave the floor to you. Okay. Hi, um, I'm Vidya Ranjit. I'm um, Director of Center for Academic Programs. Um, I oversee this SSS and 
McNair, and we also have high school program at UConn. So um, first of all, thank you to COE and also the International Access Board um, uh, for this opportunity. And most of all, I'm excited that we have 104 participants. So thank you all for joining us um, and coming to um, listen to our journey. And I hope that you will be also be able to, um, it's a life transforming um, impact of study abroad. So I hope that you'll be able to, uh, and also in, in the presentation, we, we want to learn at the question and answers that if you have done any of the programs, we'd love to hear from you. So, um, I know we are limited by time, so I'm just going to go into, you know, give you a little bit of background of uh, what the population at UConn is a little bit different um, because um, our students at UConn are conditionally accepted. So they have to come through the SSS program um, in terms of the academic need. Uh, their SAT is lower than the regular admit students. Our students are coming from under-resourced schools. Um, as Shelly was sharing her story about, um, you know, the, we are also do have a huge immigrant population. Um, again, our grant is first generation low-income students, but also many of our students are underrepresented and coming from inner cities. So a lot of the diversity African-American um, Hispanic, Asian, um, that's, that's our population. So I just wanted to give you a little bit of uh, background. So moving into, I do want to do a little question here to poll you. So um, if you can put your phone next to the, uh, what is it called? I, this is again, the QR code, or yeah. if, um, if you don't have the phone to do that, you can go into slido.com and put that number. Um, and then uh, if you're, you know, the, I would like to know the characteristics of the population that you're serving in your program. So we're gonna give you a minute to do that. Underserved, yeah. Okay. Low income first generation students. Latino, rural area, underprepared. So the big number is the low income that I see. Adults, first generation. Generational poverty, that's a big piece that you know we've been talking about here. Yeah. Resilient, yes. <laughs> that's our students, students with disabilities. Great, thank you, thank you. So there is, you know, similar population that we're doing. And then you have the ruler students and I see that. And the open enrollment. Yeah, that's a big piece. So our population varies, but again, the needs and the impact of the study abroad is going to be similar. So next question that I want to go into is what are some of the barriers of studying abroad that your students have faced? Yeah, money, that's a huge piece. Lack of information, confidence, yeah. Finances, trust, that's a huge, mindset is huge. The confidence is huge, yeah. Family. So, you know, in, in the research, they do say there's a four F, family, friends, funds, and fear. Those are the four F. And in my experience, what I've seen is I always say with my student population, they find a reason not to go. I say there's a fifth F, you know, because I had a student who's like towards the end, who's like, I can't find my birth certificate. So I guess I'm not going. We said, where were you born? We're gonna go over there and get a copy of your birth certificate. Somehow it appeared. So, it, you know, those are the big piece. Um, and we've been talking about that finance is, you know, in the research of this education abroad of our student population, they do talk about 
you know, money is really the tip of the iceberg. The rest of the things are so, you know, uh, powerful that they, they are not, they will not go. And what Shelly was talking earlier, there's so much work that needs to be done um, behind the scene for the students to prepare them to go. With my students, even I say I'm giving you every money, all the, you don't have to pay anything, they still don't want to go. You know, that, that's the piece. So if I can go into the next slide, um, I wanna share our UConn's journey. We, we're like having in the 20 years now, if you look at in 2001, I mean, before 2001, our students were studying abroad, uh, but very few, and then it was, it was a challenge. I had to lock horns with the study abroad director, the, their staff, because you know, the barriers that was put forth for the students uh, was amazingly difficult. So, um, so the, the opportunity came in 2001 when the Council for Opportunity Education had this application for studying in Liverpool. And so I said, look for one student to go. And that one student was selected. And the way we raised money was I was standing in the hallway saying, can you give me $5? Can you give me $10? I also called my association, the um, KAP, the Connecticut Association. They um, chipped in 500. I called New England Education Opportunity. Um, Association, they chipped in 500 and we were able to um, give him all of the money to go. But again, we talked about the barriers. The fear was so big for the student that uh, we had taken him to a presentation one time at the diversity conference. And over there, he had not never shared, but at that time he shared saying, this is now almost like a six, five man, right? He said he went to the airport and then, you know, if you remember Holly, <laughs> and he went to the bathroom and cried. He was so afraid to go. So for our students, even the money is not there, you know, the fear is really, really big and very real. So that happened, we sent us uh, one student um, at that point. And during that, I think it was like 2002, then the, um, the council again offered the staff exchange program. And when the staff exchange program, I had the opportunity to go. I went to Liverpool, made connections, came back, and then still sent students through the, um, the COE. You know, we sent three students. There were all these different opportunities. But then for me, I said, I want to send more. How can I send more? So in 2002, I built a, a relationship with Liverpool and started sending um, students. And we found some money, we, you know, the university. Um, I go and share my story, what Shelley says about sharing the story. Anybody who's going to listen to me, I share my story with them. And we were able to find money and send the students. But the way it was very difficult because as I said, I was locking horns with the education abroad program. They would not support me in sending the students. Um, they were always like, the GPA is low, you, the students cannot go, we cannot do this. They would not share anything with me. So um, what I did is I connected with the, um, I, had, I knew somebody at, the, at then, College of Continuing Studies since it was summer saying, can you do this? Can you help me with some money? This is impactful. And they said, yes, we did it. So on, for a couple of years, we did the program with Liverpool and then study abroad staffing changed. The director came, I even went to the president's office to complain about me saying, why is she sending students to the College of Continuing Studies, it should be in the Education Abroad Office. And we're like, yes, we want to be with you. So from there on, they even chipped in money. They said, okay, we're gonna give you a scholarship for the students, how much do you need? And, and because they saw that my students were diverse population, first generation, low income, it made them look good you know, because that's the population they were looking for. And that's the population they were serving. 
they were not able to reach these students. We have a connection with our students. We know our students, they trust us. So that's how they then decided, okay, this is a good piece. So, you know, we've done many different programs and, you know, now it's grown to about from one sending one students to 50 students. 2019, we had program in Costa Rica, Croatia, um, in Prague, um, well, <laughs> and uh, 2020, as you know, it did not happen, um, but we're looking at other different programs. So if we can go to the next slide. So just in terms of going back to the SSS, um, the, the barriers, what we, we did a lot of research on what are the barriers for our own students. And the program is really structured to remove those barriers from, you know, the, in terms of the finance, the first program that we did uh, sent students went to Liverpool, they paid $100. And I, I wanted to make sure that they uh, had some commitment to it. So it wasn't completely fee free and they only paid $100. I mean, there are times that we will talk to the students saying, do you wanna go? And even we give them saying here, we'll give you a thousand dollars spending money to go. Students still don't want to go. As I said, the fear is so real. So we, we try to take out you know, this, give them as much in terms of with our own study abroad model. And I want to share this story. We have sent our students with, um, there is a learning community here at UConn and they send students to Cape Town and we collaborated with them and said, okay, um, you know, you send 15, we'll send 15 and we'll send our staff. But the difference the, the students, again, as you know, um, Shelly talked about it, most the students that study abroad are white women and our student population is very different. And these were privileged students. Some of them had second homes or third homes. So the difference between these students was so stark that again, it, it was not something that we wanted to continue. We wanted to make sure that our students felt welcome that it was a place um, that they were supported. So what we have done is done three to four weeks short-term program so that they can come back and work because again, these students are, have to be translators uh, of their, for their family. You know, there's so many different, you know, they're giving transportation. Um, some of them, they have to help with family business. I mean, I know I'm thinking of one of my students who's like when, you know, the break came, she didn't want to go home. I'm like, why don't you want to go home? Oh, I have to now go help with my, my, fa my father's cleaning business. I don't want to go clean. So there's so much support that, um, that they provide their family that it has to be short term for them. Um, so again, the, 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 the main piece is uh, also having that uh, one of my staff goes with the students. So when the, stu when the student knows and the family knows the staff, the comfort, you know, the, the fear of the unknown, you know, they're more relaxed that there is somebody that they know um, is going with, and, uh, with their children. I remember one time when we took our students to Cape Town, <laughs> the mother was <laughs> running after a car and say, take care of my son. Um, so the worry is so big. So again, the financial piece um, is really um, that we've been able to collaborate uh, with the Education Abroad Office. I mean, keep in mind, this is the, the people that didn't want to collaborate with me now gives us more than $75,000 a year for our students um, every year that they've been support, supporting us. So moving on to the next slide. So I want to spend um, you know, some time with the impact. So these are the numbers from 2012 to 2019. We, you know, last year also we had two, two, uh, about 50 students too. So what I've been able to do is collect the data and track their graduation. 
And, you know, I didn't get the money from the education abroad just because I sent few students. It's the importance is being able to show data to, uh, to the university. So uh, we tracked and then, you know, we said, look, the impact is very high. And uh, these are the number of students going. And I'll show you graduation data in a, in a minute. But um, overall, our graduation data is 94%. And then you have, you know, these students, there's a travel bug that once they go, then they want to do it, go again. And if you look at this, um, you know, the number of SS students who have studied abroad uh, is 711, but over 100 students have again gone second or third time. And also many of the students are, have gone to do internship or, you know, or now we have a student teaching in Spain. So that experience um, for them, that one time when they go, um, Shelly shared about the impact for them about you know, the jobs. Um, I had students who went to Liverpool and came back and their teacher and put it on their resume. And when they went and it was, they said it was so nice to go into the um, interview because majority of it, they talked about her study abroad experience that that became a topic and it put her at ease uh, and she was no longer nervous. So the next slide. So I touched on this um, and Shelly also talked about it, the increased self-confidence um, for the students. I mean, so I had shared the data with our um, vice um, president of global affairs and, uh, and and they also um, our uh, diversity officer. And when they were looking at it, they said, well, you know, you're sending students with high GPA. That's why your graduation rate went high. And I said, no, 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 it's really, we are not sending students with 4.0. It's really their grades, um, really GPA increases after they have come back. So um, we, again, we had um, one of our offices uh, of institutional research then looked at the data. They looked at compared SSS students compared with the university. And what they found was there were one or two outliers, but what they found was after the student studied abroad that their GPA went higher. So that was another um, selling point of, um, you know, that the university supports us in, in uh, providing funds for our students. So, um, you know, I want to share the story of uh, the, 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 the girl in the yellow, she's studying, um, Gen Jennifer, she's right now teaching in Spain. Um, we have students that are doing a virtual internship too. Um, so the, in terms of, I mean, I also want to share this one story about Dennis who went to study in London. It, he had a 2.0 GPA and the education abroad office said, no, he cannot go. And we, you know, he said, well, maybe have, have him go next semester. And we said, well, finally we convinced him for this semester and next semester he's not going to go. So, um, they were, they agree, he went. Now, this is a student whose father was in prison. Um, one time, you know, one of his mentor took him to, out to dinner and he told his mentor saying, this is the first time I'm served. Never been to a restaurant where he was served. I mean, it brings chill to me every time I tell that story. You know, he's gone to McDonald's, never been to a restaurant. And then he studied in London, he went to Paris. Right now he's working in um, Boston, got married, has, um, um, has a child now, he's a parent. So just the, uh, the experience um, is so powerful. So um, can, I, can we go to the next slide? Okay. So in terms of, I do want to share um, some of the recommendation. Um, as earlier I said, 
um, you know, collaboration with study abroad, the same office that did not want to work with me um, because we were able to show the impact. And also the, the, the administration changing and seeing that the need of serving the first generation, low income and diverse population that they have, um, you know, supported us. So 92% um, of the, um, you know, the uh, percent of the students that studied abroad, because every year our numbers are going up, happened after we collaborated. Before I was only sending 10 or 12 students, but once the support came from the education abroad, I was able to increase to you know, 25, 30, and the goal went to 50, and soon we're looking at sending 100 students each year. Uh, and so the other piece is that I want to say is to share your story, as Shelly was saying. I, I have a SSS, I call it retention committee. So any advisory board retention committee is very, very much impactful in being able to get the, get the support. So making sure I have, um, you know, the financial, director of financial aid, director of admissions, director of education abroad, rest life, um, registrar, all of the key people serving on my retention committee. Because I say, you know, retention is, SSS retention is that's not my job. It's the job of the university and you all need to come and help us. So anything we need, you know, we need data or holes or any of that, I use the retention committee. I go and tell them my story saying, oh, we're having difficulty pulling this report and this is impacting our graduation rate then they're ready to support. So that retention committee or retention advisory board or just the SSS advisory board is uh, important. Um, Shelly talked about earlier about the uh, organization putting $10,000 uh, for, um, for students. That's so important. And I had my staff last year um, take uh, uh, advantage of the, again, the COE staff exchange program. And she was able to get some funding also from NEOA. And so encouraging your staff to go. Um, uh, for me, if your staff have not traveled, then they're not going to be able to uh, encourage their students to travel. So I'm a big proponent of having your staff um, get that experience because if they get that experience, then they will be able to encourage um, our students. You know, it takes a lot of work um, for um, to convince one student to go. I know it. You know, some sometimes I I scare them and say I tell them uh, I want to see you. And when they come to my, they're scared and like why did they calling? <laughs> and then I say you're going to go study abroad. So there's a lot of convincing um, that happens. But again creating opportunities um, for your staff. So I've been able to, uh, all of my staff have now traveled. Um, they've gone with, with the students. And what I've been able to do is also selling it to the university. So now I have collaboration with um, different schools and colleges saying, um, do you want, do you have some professional development money for your staff? And like, yeah. So you wanna pay for your staff to go half the time. So what I've been doing is I send my staff for 10 days or 11 days and I, the schools and colleges, they send one of their advisors for 10 or 11 days and the department pays for it. So it's more of, for me that they, the, the, these advisors from different departments get to know my students. So it's again, a buy-in for them. It's also professional growth and it's, it's also a connection uh, for the students and also um, that they, they know the stories of our SSS students. So it's every opportunity to, um, to sell the stories of our students. So um, I think I did talk about, you know, the data sharing, the data is so important um, that, um, uh, that we created. Um, the data um, piece of 94%. And if you can go back, uh, 
Chelsea to the data, I do want to talk about it a bit. So what happened is if you look at the all Yukon graduation is 85%. And then the minority students graduation is 82%, right? And SSS graduation is 69%. Now for, um, I in the beginning, I talked about my student population that these are students coming uh, from under-resourced schools and they're conditionally accepted. Their SAT, some of the requirements, they have not fulfilled the requirements. So these students then have to do the SSS program. So UConn might, you know, is pretty uh, happy that these students are graduating at a 69%, the SSS students. But then if you compare that 69% to students that have studied abroad, they're graduating at 94%. Now, that is powerful. The 94% is higher than the honor students graduation at UConn. So that's the story that, you know, that I've been able to um, sell. So uh, moving on, uh, Chelsea. Okay. So just to end, um, I want to say that, you know, now we're sending about 50 students, uh, but each journey begins with sending that one student once, and that's uh, Anthony, the first student that we sent um, to, um, to Liverpool, who was so scared, who, you know, was crying. And, um, and this is the same person now has traveled so many to places. He has, he's a school principal right now, and he has three kids. And his three kids, the middle name, one is London, didn't want to name Liverpool, so he did go to London. So one is London, one is Sydney, and one is Paris. And it's, that's a piece, the, the, you know, the, the change that happened, that one student um, that went there. And I, I always remember his story of crying. And here he is. And I think for me as a, you know, educator, you know, that's, that's the success that I'm so happy and that we have a very, you know, the most fun job at the university to see them grow. I mean, one of the other story that I, I'll quickly share is one student who went to Liverpool, then did an internship because uh, Trisha invited the student to do internship. So, after a few years, he said, he came and said, Vidya, you don't know what you did to me. And I was like, oh my God, what did I do? Scared, right? And he said to me, not only did you change my life, you changed my parents' life. My parents uh, are from Puerto Rico. They've never traveled. And now they've come, they came to Liverpool. We went to Spain, we traveled. So this, you know, it's not just touching our students. It's like, we're changing lives for their parents and again, their kids. So um, I hope that this was helpful for you and that, um, that you will be creating those stories for other students, those opportunities for other students. So um, I think we have time for questions now. Thank you, Dr. Ranjit. Um, that was Excellent. Uh, I think it, it, it touches just like um, Shelly's presentation, it ch touches on the possibility, right? And then you started with like one, right? It, that it's just that one step, right? Into like developing a culture that throughout the years, you're able to grow, change and transform, become a vital po component of your university institution, right? I think, I think re hearing both of you speak, it's not that you're just doing this work is that now you're vital to the institution, right? And I think that is one thing that we all seek to do, right? Because if you're vital to the institution, then you could have more, more resources for your participants. So that's very exciting. I am gonna have um, a work with Holly on um, moderating the questions. So um, let, let's look at if um, all of our participants have any questions, any thoughts. I know that there was an earlier question um, and let me just go quickly to that earlier question um, about where you get the funding from. And I know most of you did. Uh, I think Janet Craven says, does your college provide the money for scholarship or from other private foundations? So I'll let um, Shelly just 
you know, re reshare that and then Dr. Ranjit, okay? Yeah, and if I'm understanding the question, um, just correct me if I'm not understanding the question. Our college has a foundation and their role is to go out into the community and, you know, within the college with, and outside the college. So they solicit uh, funds from all kinds of sources and then they offer scholarships, you know, sometimes twice in, a, in, a, in an academic year. Um, we just developed, um, for example, after the George Floyd killing, we created a racial and social justice scholarship and that has been raising a lot of money. So that's the job of the foundation. But maybe I'm not understanding the question completely. There's many, many sources of funding that comes in. No, I think if that I works. Can, yeah, right I can jump in. I mean, in the beginning, with uh, we did collaborate with financial aid because there is funding for students that are Pell eligible. Um, but then, you know, we we look at money everywhere, different departments calling the departments because they have scholarships. Uh, School of Business each year has been supporting um, the students. Um, so they'll kick in 2000 here, 3000 from some department. We have also funding from the Dean of Students Office for Student First um, funds. So we really go into um, different uh, places. But the first year, what we did was really, the first couple of years uh, was we worked with uh, financial aid. And then we also went in um, in the summer to for students um, that were Pell eligible. So they also get Pell uh, funding uh, in the summer. So a lot of our students to get the Pell funding, generally what it is, is that they have to get six credits. So our students were only getting three credits. It was difficult. So then we increased it to um, for students to be taking six credits. So that way then the Pell kicked in and, um, and then the, the funds from different departments. Right now, you know, against the buy-in is, is very huge now at UConn that, you know, when I call and say, you know, can you kick in this much money uh, for a student? They're like, sure, you know, because they see it, um, how impactful it is. But I think the first piece is sending one or two, building, first sending that one or two kit, and then you have some data, then you're able to um, get support. Thank you. So I'm gonna, um, there is a question by Erickson Aquino, and we have Angelica and also Matt on the line. And I think, um, you know, I just want to make sure that I clarify that federal grants funding cannot be utilized to travel abroad, right? Yes. So nothing comes out of your trio federal funds to travel abroad. <laughs> Right, it, it's not an allowable. Um, even if it meets your, your, it meets you know some of your objectives or your goals or the mission, it does not matter. It cannot be used. So that's when we taught when when both of our presenters and many of us who have taken students abroad, we do not look at the trio grant funds to do any of this. And that's where the additional component happens, right? Um, so I'm going to read now the question so that way now it's framed. Um, we we are ta we are. This is from Erickson Aquino. And he says, we are a talent search program from one. Recently, recently, US accredited universities have been established in South Korea and Japan. We would like to travel and accompany our uh, first generation low income high school students, about 10 students, to expose them to post secondary inst institution and also for personal development within the Pacific region, since it's near one. We have also met with the university's admission team to discuss what program they could offer during the campus visit, such as meeting colleges, students, and talking about their college experience. However, from my understanding, federal funders are not level costs for foreign travel. Would that apply even if we plan to provide a required service within the allowable costs under the section? Um, so again, I think the question really touches on that. Even if it's a post-secondary institution, you're leaving the United States or its territories, that's just not allowable. Um, so that's just something to, to keep in mind. However, you know, Mara and myself and other people that work with pre-college programs, we have taken students abroad. It's just the same uh, process as Dr. Ranjet and Director Se uh, Siegel is we find other pots of money outside, right? Institutional funds, uh, foundation money. Um, you know, you could go ahead and do some 
um, um, other type of resources that will get you that funding. So hopefully that answers that question. Yes, Mara, do you want to share anything if, else? If I can yes, add, yes. We, we have a donor that comes to our SSS broad presentation every year. This year we didn't have it, but she comes. Uh, and again, our students, after they study abroad, they, they come back and do a presentation of their experience. And she has been, in terms of every year, uh, been so impressed with what uh, our students, you know, when they share their stories of how transformed they are, that each year she's been giving uh, a lot of money to the university. And now the university, I did a presentation with a couple of our students to the uh, board of directors for the, of the foundation to talk about SSS study abroad, because now our vice president of global affairs wants to have an endowment, um, not just this 100,000 coming every year, but an endowment that it's there so that it's generated. Uh, so it's again, you know, the, it took us a long time, you know, 20 years to do this, um, but some money that the foundation may have um, that they will be able to, we, we've done fundraising uh, for, uh, through the foundation. So we have some money in the foundation that we're able to pull to give to our students. So we've used many varieties of funds, but not the, the federal funds. Go ahead, Mara. Yes, I just wanted to pinpoint uh, that when, let me take this, <laughs> when um, I did my presentation a couple of months ago, we discussed specifically about pre-college programs and how they can then do territories. I mean, you're in Guam and this is for Ericsson, then you can probably do uh, Hawaii or maybe somebody in the Pacific coast of the continental US and that you can pay with your funds. So if you want to start, you know, that first step, then you can probably start there and then start looking for, you know, partnerships and sponsors and everything. But that will be your first step if that's the first thing you want to do. Thank you so much, Mara. Uh, Holly, do you want to uh, read Kevin Todd's question? Um, well, yes, and Mara, I was hoping you would also address <laughs> I was the going to. <laughs> of uh, travel to Puerto Rico. Exactly, yes. I mean, again, in my presentation, I talk about traveling to Puerto Rico, which is also at all costs being a territory. So again, Guam, Hawaii, Puerto Rico, US Virgin Islands. I mean, you can all do all of those and those are at all costs that you can use federal funding for that. All right, great. So we had a couple of questions about funding, um, funding uh, scholarship sources, and but also this particular question about Vidya, could you address, um, are your students going on programs, the questioner wanted to know that, are these programs specifically for SSS students or are they sort of just participating in UConn general programs? What, what are they? So we have students that will go to the general, um, um, uh, you know, with the other students. But in the summer, we have just for our SSS students. So as I was talking earlier, when we did the program with Cape Town, uh, for Cape Town with non-SSS students, what we found it was there was so much, you know, the, the, the gap between the different students. So we wanted to make sure that our students felt comfortable. So it's only SSS students. Um, we send about you know 15 to 20 students in each of the program, and then one of my staff goes with with um, with the students. And they it also what happened is when we had three programs, my three staff were gone. <laughs> then we also had a summer program, so I had to be creative and provide opportunities. So uh, we. Uh, have partnered with different schools and colleges. So 50% um, the, of the time, one of my staff goes and 50% uh, one of the advisors from other schools go. So it's just our students. Great, well, thanks so much. That, now, question for both Bidya and Shelley is, can you talk about, um, have you applied, I know you have, <laughs> apply, helped your students apply for Gilman, the Gilman Scholarship, and what is your success rate in that? I, um, I can, I mean, with my student, 
generally, um, if they have applied, um, and again, the the office, the honors office has that, the Gilman Scholarship that they support, and they will work closely, uh, what Shelley was saying earlier in their application. And I mean, I can, I have not seen a student not getting it, the Gilman Scholarship. A majority of our students have gotten it. So um, again, for our students to apply, first of all, taking the time has been difficult, but so far our students have received it. Great, and Shelly, can you talk about your experience? Because I know you've not only helped students, but you've actually served as a reader for Gilman. Yeah, that's, and I would, I would just echo what Dr. Rajit just said. Um, we've had, uh, I would say, 100% success <laughs> with Gilman and, yeah, you, if, if you have the opportunity to be a reader for them, I would reach out to the, to the organization. They're always looking for readers. And it is, it's labor intensive. I'm not, I mean, to apply is labor intensive and to read is labor intensive, but it is well worth it because they, they give a lot of funding. They provide a lot of funding. And um, so yes, we've had great success, but yes, we, we, we have to accompany them with the application process, it's become quite cumbersome. So, yeah. Um, uh, I have a question from Natalie Gomez. Uh, she says, aside from finances, what are other important factors to consider in starting a study abroad program? I, you know, the piece is the making the students comfortable. They're so afraid, you know, the fear. You know, we've had students where uh, their families will say, no, what we did is we made a card to give it to their family um, saying, okay, take this to your parents. So it says, we'll earn this credit. All of the benefits we've listed um, for the parents. So that's another piece that we had to develop because the family uh, were against it. Um, so that, that family, the friends, you know, girlfriends, boyfriends, those are the, the barriers. And so there's a lot of work that the counselors, the advisors have to spend telling them this is a great experience. So one of the pieces that what we've done is every summer when our, because our students, again, as I said, they are conditionally accepted. So we have a summer program for them. So doing, it's just the right time. So our students who studied abroad, they come back and then they do a presentation to this incoming freshman. As you know, Shelly was sharing about, you've talked about it so much that I had to do it, right? So with our students that we have so many points, times that we're introducing this education abroad um, to the students. And then finally they'll say, okay, I'll do it. Some students, I have to say, we've, we've not been successful. Um, that they have, um, you know, even I said, I'll give you a thousand dollars more um, so that you're, you have spending money, they still will not do it. But the, you know, having that, the card that uh, one of my staff now, she used to work at, in the study abroad office. So she's been an asset for us in developing all of these um, information packets for our students. So she has put in this card where list the benefit and then they take it to their parents saying, show this to your parent and say, you're gonna get this, you're gonna get this, this is what you're gonna be marketable. Um, and that has helped. I hope that was, ans I answered your question. Excellent, thank you. Um, there's another question about, um, for both of you, um, since there isn't travel right now, what are each of you doing in your programs to prepare students so that they'll be ready to travel when it's possible? Shelly, you wanna take that first? Yeah, um, we are still heavily promoting study abroad in our, we're doing all the things that we normally do However, it's a little tricky because we are working remotely, so we can't have as much high touch in terms of being in the office. Um, but in all of our recruiting, um, we still are offering the workshops and students know, and we all are hoping 
uh, it won't be much longer when we can travel again. So we're putting it in their minds. We're planting the seeds. Um, and I wanted to add to that last question too, which is with family, because that is a barrier that, 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 that we will often bring families into our office along with the students. We've had to do that many times. And because they, they're sometimes a lot more nervous than the students. <laughs> and there's just a lot of fear out there, like you say, um, Vidya. And so, but anyway, that we're still doing, we're still, we're still uh, promoting it and just saying, you know, this, is, this right now is probably not going to happen. We're looking into some virtual programs, but we're still saying, you know, you still want to be thinking about these opportunities because they are going to come back. At um, UConn, what we've been doing is right now we're promoting the virtual internship, and um, it's it's a piece that last this fall we did not do it, and then our education abroad approached us saying that they've already done some research and that it shows that the virtual uh, internship is also impactful. And you know they are looking at virtual education abroad program. I said no, they can watch the TV. It's not, I don't think I want people to be doing virtual education abroad. Uh, they can take a class here. But in terms of the internship, uh, when you know they showed us the data. So right now that's what we're promoting our students. You know for the spring semester and the summer. Um, we, it doesn't look like we will have a summer um, intern, um, the education abroad, um, but for, we're also looking for um, January to take students to Peru for a short term during uh, spring break. So we're st working on it um, to, it's still in our radar. I mean, we're very sad that we couldn't send our 50 students last year to those three countries. Thank you, Dr. Ranjit. Um, there's one last question uh, and that came in from the Q&A. Um, so thank you, Mara, for, for um, pointing that out. So this is from Andrea Fakar. Do you run into issues where a student program, sorry, do you run into issues where a student's program of study will not have room for a study abroad credit? Our program have very few open electives in them. I am worried that a summer study abroad class for our students wouldn't fit in many of their degree programs. Shelly? Okay, stab at that. Um, yeah, uh, that, that can be an issue. Um, what we've done in some, in some cases is we may, we may take a look at the kind of credits that are being offered in a program, a specific short-term program, and just see if there's any way to work with a specific faculty member to, to see if it could come in um, as a requirement. Um, then the other piece to think about too is, while we don't want students taking credits they don't need, in some ways, the actual experience of being abroad is enhancing their, um, port their resume, their, their um, co-curricular resume. So, and as I mentioned earlier in my presentation, just how having gone abroad enhances their life experience with job opportunity, leadership, all of those things can sometimes surpass just a credit or so, but I understand your question, yeah. Dr. Ranjit, anything you wanna to add to that? No, I, um, we do have some students that have had those issues, but um, the right now the curriculum also allows the the diversity piece and that some of the students have been able to work with the faculty or their major advisors to tr um, have that credit and say okay this will fulfill this group requirement so um, even there it's not something that you know it's in the books but again the my staff will work with the students say you need to talk to your faculty and say, you know, uh, they will agree to switch it. So we've had those ex experiences and, and the advisors have been able to sign off. So that's a piece that I would recommend. Thank you so much. So as you could see, um, thank you very much for both of our, our presenters. We're getting to that time. I also wanna be mindful of everybody's time. 
Um, but I think, you know, uh, uh, to close it up in, in some way, right? And I'll, I'll also um, have um, our co-chair Mara Luna and Holly uh, intervene or, or offer any more last minutes before I show everyone the international access commun uh, community um, on the COE portal. Um, but I think it, what it really looks at is how you do develop the programming, right? So it's not just really saying, okay, we need to send students abroad. This is the international access office, send them there, right? It takes a lot more than that, right? And in both presentations, there's a lot of like support throughout the whole process, right? So I think that's why when you see the difficulties that might happen, it's the staff that's there with them, right? To make sure that this occurs, that this happens. So I think, you know, that's, that's a really uh, powerful component of it. Once you become, once you make your program, your trio program, um, look at international access as a key component, even if it's not funded by the grant, but if it's a key component, because it's gonna help you grow all of the other objectives, right? And once you see it as a key component, I think you are able to actually make a lot of changes. Um, so, and, and, you know, provide the students with this uh, opportunities, right? And whatever it is, the, the thing that might come to not allow us to do that with them, we still uh, find ways to, to be able to support them and give them that opportunity. Um, I said a couple of times, you know, most of our work is about how do we um, work so that we could offer opportunity, access, equity, and inclusion, right? Um, in a world that does not provide that all the time, right? So I think this is a, there's very powerful um, uh, conversations. Thank you very much. Mara, Holly, anything you want to share before I share the community practice page? Again, I just want to reiterate, you know, make them aware that coming to any of the territories is an allowable cost. You don't need a passport. You know, it's a lot easier. And still, you can give that first step to your students, especially those free college students, to get that vibe. Coming to Puerto Rico is a different language. It's a different culture. You know, it's a start. Same thing if you go to Guam, same thing if you go to Hawaii, not a different language, but yes, it's a different culture. And it's a start. It's just that, like like uh, Dr. Ranjit said, it's that first step. It's just planting that seed, okay? Go ahead. And, um, I just want to say that if any anyone uh, would like to chat with me, um, I, we can, uh, now we're in virtual offices, but I'd be happy to share my number. Um, I think uh, Holly has it. I think she put it up there. So I'd be happy to share, to chat with you. Thank you so much, Holly. Um, no, um, thanks, I, whoever, thank you for whomever. Thanks to both of you um, for wonderful presentations. Um, I just wanted to connect people. If you did enjoy this conversation and wanna continue um, the dialogue, um, please join the International Access Community Practice by going to the COE website under communities. You'll find a link um, and a way to join um, to join there. We're also on Facebook, the International Access Community of Practice. Um, and we know that um, Bidya and Shelley are, are two of probably several people out there who were part of this today who have, you know, have some experiences to share. And so really we want the community of practice to be a resource for all of you. Um, so thanks so much for being here and thanks Aaron and Mara for facilitating. And um, we hope to see you, we hope to see you here in this space or in the community of practice soon. Very well, thank you everyone. And don't miss out to join us in the community of practice. It's completely free. Okay. And you know, that will give us the resources that we need to be a amazing, pro have amazing programs, international access, just like uh, Shelly's and Vita's. Thank you very much, everyone. You'll have a great evening. Thank you again. Thank you. Thanks, thank you guys. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye.